In this video, I'm going to be looking at how you can score full marks in your AQA chemistry paper, and that's your paper one. Now, I get asked this an awful lot, so I really wanted to share with you my top tips on how you can score as many marks as possible and avoid losing marks. Now, we'll start by looking at the periodic table, because for me, doing well in chemistry is all about understanding how the periodic table works. And through that understanding, you can unlock many, many marks that will be asked. So we'll go over that now. Remember that the right hand side is the non-metals. The left hand side is the metals. And therefore, what comes with that is specific properties. Remember that metals are good conductors of heat and electricity and that's due to their free electrons. They tend to be hard. They tend to have high melting points. In comparison, non-metals are non-conductors. The exception here is graphite, which is an allotrope of carbon. They tend to be quite soft and they tend to have low melting points. Obviously, there are exceptions to these rules. Something like mercury is a metal which is unusual in that it has a low melting point. And then carbon, in the form of graphite and diamond, is extremely hard and has a very high melting point, and that's over here. So these rules don't apply to every single element, but in general they hold true. So now what can we also determine from the periodic table? Well, remember that group 1 metals are known as the alkali metals. This means that when they are added to water, they produce an alkaline solution. So hopefully, therefore, that will help you realise that metals produce basic oxides. They're effectively pHs above 7. And therefore, by definition, because we tend to know that the opposite is true for the non-metals, we can say that they form acidic oxides. And remember, your example is always asking you about this sort of thing. So try and use the fact that group 1 metals are known as alkali metals to help you with that. Now, if we look more closely at the key, it's really important that you understand how this works. The top number, we're told, is the relative atomic mass. The bottom number is the atomic number. Now, the atomic number equals the proton number. And because elements are neutral, it also equals the electron number. Why is that? Well, that's because protons have a charge of plus one, electrons have a charge of minus one. So therefore, we need to have equal numbers of protons and electrons in order for our atom to be neutral. Now, that top number is the mass number. And that's made up of both the proton and neutron number. Why is that? Well, that's because protons have a mass of 1 and neutrons have a mass of 1. Electrons have a tiny mass and therefore are not counted in the mass number. So if we have a look at an example, how about fluorine? What is its atomic number? Well, according to the key, it is 9. What is its mass number? Well, according to the key that is 19. Now we can start working out extra things. So what about the proton number? Well, I've already said that the atomic number is the same as the proton number. So therefore, fluorine's proton number is 9. What is its electron number? Well, because I've said it's the same as the proton number, it's also 9. Lastly, we can work out its neutron number based on the fact that we know its mass number is 19. We know that its proton number is 9. So what must its neutron number be? Well, it must be 19 take 9, so it is 10. So really, really get to grips with what your key is telling you on the periodic table. Let's now look at electronic configurations. Taking the element beryllium, remember only two electrons can go into the first shell, and then after that, it's eight electrons. We know that its electron number is four, so therefore its electronic configuration is two, two. How about sodium? Well, it has 11 electrons, so therefore its electronic configuration is 2, 8, 1. How about lithium now? It only has an electron number of 3, so it's 2, 1. So what can we see from both of these elements which are in the same group? Well, we can see that they both have the same number of electrons in the outer shell. And that actually explains why all elements in the same group have the same chemical properties, because they have the same number of outer shell electrons.
Now let's clear some space so we can actually make some more additions. So what else have we learned? Well, we've learned that a vertical column in the periodic table is known as a group and that all elements in the same group have the same number of outer shell electrons. Now don't forget that the group number is provided. This is group 1, this is group 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 0 or 8. So we know that all the elements in a particular group have the same number of outer shell electrons. So it corresponds with their group number. Group 1, lithium, sodium, potassium, etc. will have one electron in the outer shell. Group 7, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, etc. will have seven electrons in the outer shell. But how about we take a horizontal row now? take this one. Well, a horizontal row is known as a period, and again they correspond. So here's period 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. What is true about elements in the same period? Well, let's work it out. Let's compare sodium's electronic configuration, 281. That's because it has 11 electrons, with aluminium's electronic configuration, which is 283. And then with sulfur's electronic configuration, which is 283. Six. What do all these elements have in common? Well, notice that they all have three shells of electrons. So what is true for all elements in the same period? They have the same number of shells of electrons. Next up, we can use the periodic table to help us work out the charges on various ions. Now notice that for the metals, the charge on the ion is the same as the group number, so for sodium it will just be Na1+, magnesium it will be Mg2+, aluminium it will be Al3+. Notice that this chunk of elements is the transition metals. It's going to be much harder for you to remember their charges on the ions because unfortunately you just have to learn those off by heart. The key ones for me to learn would be Zn2+, which is zinc, Ag+, which is silver, Au plus, which is gold. Iron is unusual. It's either Fe3 plus or Fe2 plus, but luckily, when they give you the exam question, it will say something like this, and that Roman numerals inside the bracket will actually tell you the charge on the ion. Copper is also important, which is Cu2 plus. Next up, understanding what the ion charges are on the non-metals, well, quite straightforward. You don't have to learn them. You just need to learn that the charge on the ion is 8 minus their group number. So for non-metals, the charge on the ion is 8 minus the group number. So for nitrogen, that's in group 5, so 8 minus 5 is 3, so its charge on its ion will be N3 minus. Be very careful, it's minus when it comes to looking at the ion charges for non-metals. Oxygen it's going to be 8 minus 6, so that's O2 minus. Fluorine, 8 minus 1, so that's F minus. Remember that the group 0 elements are monatomic, so they exist as single atoms. Why? Because they are very unreactive. Why? Because they have a full outer shell. Right, you might have wondered why I know that the charges on the metal ions are positive and why I know that the charges on the non-metals are negative, and that's all due to ionic bonding, so I'm actually going to demonstrate that now. So the way in which we prove this is by let's do an ionic bonding diagram for sodium chloride. So we'll start by drawing the electronic configuration for sodium. We know it has 11 electrons. Let's do chlorine now. We know it has 17 electrons. And now what needs to happen now? Well, they both want to become full, so the best thing is for sodium to donate its final electron to chlorine. And so if we redraw both shells, notice that sodium has lost its electron and it has plopped it onto chlorine. So now we need brackets in order to show the charges on the ion. Well, because sodium lost an electron, remember it's negatively charged, it's now positively charged. Because chlorine gained a negative electron, it's now negatively charged. So to actually show you, the charge on the sodium ion is Na+, the charge on the chlorine ion is Cl-. And going back, remember I said that sodium was in group 1, so it would have a 1 plus charge. Chlorine is in group 7, so it will have the Cl minus charge. So hopefully you see that the periodic table is incredibly logical. I now want to touch on which elements are diatomic. You're just going to have to learn that some elements exist as two atoms. So oxygen, 
nitrogen, hydrogen, etc. This is going to be important when you write chemical equations because otherwise you'll never be able to balance them if you haven't realized that hydrogen is diatomic, for example. Now, my friend taught me this mnemonic. Horses need oats for clear brown eyes. I know it's weird looking eyes like that, but I'll explain why now. So what elements do these represent? Well, horses is hydrogen, need is nitrogen, oats is oxygen, four is fluorine, clear is chlorine, brown is bromine, eyes is iodine. We've looked at the periodic table and now I'm going to cover what my last minute notes would be. So this is a piece of paper where you scribble a few things on that you're still not quite sure on. The piece of paper you'll look at just before you go into the exam, just to reaffirm things that you were a little bit concerned about. So one of those things for me would have been Rutherford's gold foil experiment. I remember he did this experiment to try and ascertain more about the structure of an atom. So what did he actually do? So he fired alpha particles at gold foil. Remember that alpha particles are positively charged. What he found was that most of the alpha particles passed straight through the foil. So what did he infer from that or understand by that? Well, he understood, therefore, that the atom is largely empty space, which contradicted a lot of what people had originally thought about the atom. He then found that some alpha particles were deflected a little, which means they must have come across something which was positively charged, which we now know is the nucleus because it contains protons. And then lastly, very few alpha particles were deflected a lot. And this told Rutherford that the nucleus is very small. So through his experiments with alpha particles, we got quite a good understanding about the structure of the atom by Rutherford. We found out that the atom is largely made up of empty space, that the nucleus is positively charged and that it is also very small. So be prepared to describe his experiments and then explain his conclusions that he drew from those experiments. We'll just quickly touch on Bohr and Chadwick because they were also interested in the structure of the atom. I'm just going to write a really brief summary of what they found. Well, he found that electrons are arranged in levels at different distances from the nucleus. And then lastly, Chadwick, well, what did he prove? Well, he proved the existence of neutrons. So all three men were instrumental in proving the structure of the atom. Now remember that everyone's last minute notes will be different and that's because you're all different people and you'll all have different things that you will want to remind yourselves of before the exam. Now for me, learning equations off by heart was always difficult. So in my last minute notes, I would include the blast furnace. So remember, the blast furnace was used to extract iron. In terms of raw materials, you need coke, which contains the element carbon, hematite, which is iron oxide, and lastly limestone. Why is the limestone added? Well, it's to remove acidic impurities. So, what happens in the first stage of the blast furnace? Well, the coke reacts with oxygen, forming carbon dioxide. In the second stage, carbon dioxide reacts with more coke to form carbon monoxide. And remember, the carbon monoxide acts as a reducing agent later on, taking that oxygen away from the iron, because remember, that's what a reducing agent is. The important step is the next step, so the carbon monoxide reacts with the iron oxide in order to produce that iron plus carbon dioxide. Let's balance it. So here the iron is reduced. Now we need to concern ourselves with the limestone. Remember its formula is CaCO3, it's calcium carbonate. When you heat it, it breaks down to form calcium oxide plus carbon dioxide. They could ask you what type of reaction this is. This is a thermal decomposition reaction because you're using heat to break down the calcium carbonate. And then calcium oxide plus the acidic impurities we're trying to remove, which are actually silicon dioxide, produces calcium silicate. Remember your calculator, Casio? Well, that's going to help you remember the formula of calcium silicate, CaSiO3. Make sure you use the upper and lowercase letters appropriately. Use your periodic table to help you. Calcium's formula is this. Silicon is this. Oxygen is this. If they ask you what type of reaction this is, well, it's a neutralisation reaction. 
Now, one of my least favourite topics is the manufacture of salts topic. It's really important that you can describe how various salts are made. Now, if you're being asked to make a soluble salt, notice that it can't contain ammonium, potassium or sodium when you use the crystallisation method. And the simplest way to describe this is that you react the acid and most likely a metal oxide because these are basically your ingredients needed to make the salt. Then you filter in order to remove any unreacted solid. You evaporate to remove, crucially, some of the water. And then you cool your solution and allow it to dry so that the crystals form. So dry in a warm place. Make sure you specify a drying method or on filter paper or in a drying oven. And that, for me, is the simplest way of describing this method. Now you could be asked how you make soluble salts that do contain ammonium, sodium or potassium. Now the problem with these salts is they're so super soluble that they would constantly dissolve when they're made so there'd be no excess to filter off. So instead we have to use a titration method in order to do this. Now a titration method allows us to work out the exact volumes of the two reactants that we need to make sure that there's no excess. Now this is only my last minute notes, make sure you watch my full video in order to understand more about a titration because this is not the place for me to describe exactly how a titration works. But the crucial thing underpinning a titration is that you place an indicator in the conical flask, add exact volume of reactant from the burette and because that indicator will change colour at the exact moment that the right amount of reactant has been added, you then know the exact volumes that you need of the two reactants. So then you want to repeat the experiment and we're just going to dive in at the crystallization method. So we're going to repeat using exact volumes of reactants as determined by titration. And then we just dive in with our previous method. So we filter, we evaporate to remove some of the water, we cool and we dry in a warm place to allow the crystals to form. So just be aware of the two methods and if in doubt, make sure you do that blue method for either salt. As long as it's a soluble salt, then you'll definitely score some marks. The only reason you carry out a titration to begin with is to work out the exact volumes required to produce the ammonium, sodium or potassium salts. Remember that my revision guide is crammed full of these sorts of perfect answers, so if you like concise, succinct answers, then head to our online shop in order to have a look at the previews of the revision guide.